Anna Trell is a Canadian-born intellectual historian, a classicist, a philosopher, a psychonaut, and a musician. Dan is also known online under the moniker The Modern Hermeticist, and he has a blog, a YouTube channel, and a Twitter presence under the same name. In this podcast, we speak with Dan about anything and everything related to Hermeticism, its history, its philosophical tenets, and its actual manifestations in the modern world. We also talk about the influence hermeticism has on esoteric practices and magic, the importance of fitness and physical health in a hermetic context, and we even touch on the American philosopher, dream weaver, and psychonaut Terence McKenna as well, and much more. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, I give you Mr. Dan Attrell. Dan Attrell, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thanks, Alex. It's nice to be here. Well, it's a pleasure, absolutely. Um, you are known online as the Modern Hermeticist, and you have a website, you have a Twitter account, you have a YouTube channel, and, and I want to get into all that. But can we just start a little bit with your background, your educational history can you share a little bit about how you got interested in this sealed subject known as hermeticism <laughs> sure i came to hermeticism rather obliquely I, I came to it probably first my interest in the ancient world was propelled by having been raised within a, a traditionally religious protestant household and so I was raised uh, from a very early age with scripture, with Bible, with things like um, spiritual principles and uh, spiritual warfare and that kind of stuff. So all, all of these things kind of propelled my interest into the occult, into, into hidden things. History was kind of coupled with that because, you know, you're reading the Bible, so you're reading about ancient Hebrews and Romans and Greeks and stuff like that. And so that's all a mess in your head when you're young. You, you, you can't really distinguish what's what and who's doing who and, and what's going on kind of in the greater scheme of things. There's just kind of a blur that is the ancient world where everything runs contiguously uh, and, and there's no distinction or boundaries or markers to help you figure out what you're actually looking at. So that propelled me into history and kind of sorting out the whole, the whole mess. What worked for me was studying religious history or intellectual history, so politics and culture and all these kinds of things. but. I am, but not as much, uh, interested in material culture. So archaeology, uh, you know, I've done some, some digging in Romania and, you know, I like it and it was kind of like a service to the discipline kind of thing. And, but it's, uh, it's not really my cup of tea. I, I'm more interested in, in kind of the idea sphere. Mm -hmm. And so that's what propelled me toward hermeticism, which is, depending on whether you want to think of it in the modern term or in the ancient term, either way, it's a synthesis of ideas, often conflicting or contradictory ideas that are allowed to stand as a sort of coincidence of opposites. And so that school of thought of, of kind of, you know, okay, what well, what do these people think? What do Buddhists think? What do... What do Catholics think? What do uh, voodoo priests think? I don't know. You just grab it all, bring it all together, and let's look at this kind of with a feigned objectivity, because I don't really believe objectivity is possible. Um, <laughs> right. I mean, I think there is an objective world, but it's outside of us. I think that that is how I came to hermeticism, was by a kind of... I guess a mainstream approach uh and and then i got into it through studying mystery cults 
And uh, mystery cults kind of, you know, you start reading the, the literature from that in the ancient world, and eventually you can't help but get to uh, the Corpus Hermeticum and the Hermetic texts. So you start looking into that stuff, and then you start reading about the Renaissance Hermeticists and, and then the Hermeticists of the uh, Victorian age, of the occult Renaissance in the, in the Victorian era. And uh, you start getting into Manly P. Hall and this kind of stuff. So there's a huge, rich tradition that can be followed. And it's, to me, what was important was to examine the tradition uh, historically, like apply historicism, to, to look at things within their context. Because a lot of people who look into Hermeticism, they kind of, they read the Kabbalion or they read um, some sort of stuff that was written in the 19th century or the 20th century even, and they retro project that. They, they send it back in time and they say, okay, this is what like the Egyptians believed. And I'm like, well, no, this is someone's, you know, modern adaptation or adaption of what he perceived in the ancient texts. But this isn't the ancient texts themselves, not even close. Right. So for me, it was important to disentangle all that stuff, to look at all of it uh, set apart and kind of divided. And, and um, so that was my my approach to it. Well, that is very fascinating. And for the listeners who don't know, we'll put a link in the video description. But uh, as of the recording of this interview, you have put up of the giant project that you started called the Encyclopedia Hermetica, a big history, uh, 44 parts so far. So for at least 44 hours, each video can be about an hour ish. You have gone into this huge history on Hermeticism. And I definitely want to talk about that. But first, really briefly, uh, for the listeners out there, especially if they're in the esoteric community or if they study, you know, Hermeticism or if they consider themselves a Renaissancean Hermetic magician, if they go back to these texts in, in Europe and before, can you give us kind of a, like, your definition of Hermeticism, you know, Danitrell's definition of what, if you were to boil this down to a few key words or key concepts, which I know is an incredibly loaded question and very hard to do, obviously, considering you're on the 44th video of uh, the Encyclopedia Hermetica. <laughs> but if you were to say, you know, for instance, Christianity, you, there's a, a savior aspect, there's a, a redemptive aspect, there's an original sin aspect, you know, Judaism is this, that, and the other. For, her, for, the, for the actual ideas embodied in the hermetic tradition, what is your base definition for our listeners of hermeticism, so to speak? I think if I had to distill it all down into one kind of very, very, very stripped down interpretation I would look at the world as the one and the many that's really what kind of hermeticism really means is that the world never never settles it, it is always in an endless oscillation between the one and the many between objectivity and subjectivity between left-wing thinking or right-wing thinking, between hot and cold, between these, these opposites are constantly dancing and producing the, the world or the, you know, the phenomena that we perceive as the world. And hermeticism is, is disentangling that without forcing it to a close. And I would say that that applies to ancient hermeticism as much as it applies to kind of 19th century reconstruction hermeticism, the Kabbalion type stuff. Truly ancient hermeticism, or at least in its earliest form, what that was all about was syncretizing Egyptian and Greek thinking. Now, I don't want to overstress this, or overstress this idea that Egyptians are irrational or maybe irrational, whereas Greeks are logical. That's just that's too strong of a kind of dichotomy, but they definitely had two divergent intellectual traditions and they perceived the world in a very different way. And so 
you have this kind of rich intellectual climate in Alexandria, which which has uh, Jews and Egyptians and Greeks and Arabs and Indians and all sorts of other people. And they're all bringing their, their ideas together, their holy texts. And these become reconciled in some sense in the Corpus Hermeticum. And so that's really my interest with the, with that whole lecture series is disentangling all these different threads that, that make up Hermeticism. It's, it's so easy for people to get lost in, um, certainly when I first started reading it, I was like, ooh, the Kabbalion, and, you know, I'm getting into all this early 20th century stuff, thinking that it, it had roots that were, you know, thousands of years old and, and not realizing, or, you know, you look at the Golden Dawn and their hermetic aspects, and you're like, yeah, this is all 100%, you know, has its roots in some aspect of history, and then you realize... You know, as you just said, that uh, no, there's there's certainly um, roots there, but it's there is a lot of reading reading back into that. When you read the Corpus Hermeticum, you're just blown away by the fact that there is nothing but, as one translation says, just the experience, almost the visionary experience of this sweet, joyous light, this all encompassing man Shepernian mind that just literally just takes you to a new elevated state of consciousness. Is right. That- I mean, it's the one um, lurking behind many phenomena, you know, all the smoke and the lights and the, and the, the shifting and, and this kind of dragon figure that's in the Poimandries. It's, it's the one and the many. Yes, yes. Or to quote Terence McKenna, it's a multidimensional psychedelic object at the end of time that's slowly pulling us towards it in some weird, you know, multidimensional consciousness raising elevation, which which is certainly an, an interesting interesting way to to experience it for sure. Right. Or or destroying <laughs> or destroy. That's, yes. That's the other thing is that, you know, Terrence McKenna, uh, he, he likes to really put a spin on it that it is this positive kind of transcendental, hopeful thing. And that that's a good thing. Well, it's like I call that monist death math. And um, it is <laughs> the it is the denial of life of the many. It is it is the worship of, of death, of singularity of the one. And so, you know, it is it is transcendent and it is sublime and it is necessary as part of this kind of constant dance between the one and the many, but it is ultimately the extinction of all difference, which means the extinction of all life because life is difference. (laughs) I I remember to that point, I remember Terrence McKenna mentioned that, you know, as soon as someone discovered how to invent a time machine, effectively history is over at that point because once you can close the circular loop back you know to any point in time it effectively ends historical context you know right goes to your point about you know it's it's then time for humanity in in either a as you mentioned a a a death uh of sorts or a transformation of sorts to completely reevaluate itself and i always wonder if if uh you and I will be around for that, you know? You always wonder, time-wise. We all will ultimately experience our own individual transcendental objects at the end of time. So, you know, the apocalypse is for everyone. It's It doesn't really matter if it happens kind of on the objective stage, because it's going to happen to everybody on the subjective stage. I love that quote, the apocalypse is for everyone. I might have to tweet that later and attribute it to you, uh, Dan. Um, Well, to continue with the small mouth noises, as Terrence McKenna would say, why don't we talk about history a little bit? Because your Encyclopedia Hermetica, A Big History, is on its 44th part now. And we'll make sure to put a link to the videos and your channel in the description of this video. But can you tell us, um, what was the main genesis behind starting an entire series did you feel that hermetic history and literature at that point was was missing a few things that you wanted to touch on or did you feel that you wanted to look at the history and share your own personal view of it was it kind of a mix between the two uh what what started this whole thing i mean there were kind of a a number of of reasons why I started. Um, One of them was that I had seen that 
in kind of the world, in, in the public sphere, not so much in the academic sphere, but th places like YouTube and that sort of thing, uh, when it comes to the occult or when it comes to even just history, things are either add -ified, made kind of bite size and kind of <laughs> tri trivialized in a way, or they're just flat out crazy. Like there's just there's just so much insanity in the in the occult because it it is the kind of thing that attracts and a, appeals to a wide range of people and it and it kind of facilitates or gives legitimacy to some kind of crackpot kind of thinking you know everything from flat Earth to time cube it's like there's just an endless ocean of of people who want to believe anything and get really dogmatic about it too so that was i don't want to say it's alarming to me but i was like okay well if i get a complaint about it then i better do my part and do what i think is setting the record straight or at least give my my perspective on things and so the problem is when you are in academia, nobody cares what your opinion is, right? And so it, it doesn't matter what you um, want to say. You, you just you have to say what someone else has already said it, it, or back it up with evidence and facts, which is totally a good and, and excellent thing, and that's admirable. It doesn't allow you to kind of rap freely about these subjects, and people get lost in that. Uh, nobody wants to read these kind of like dry, long treaties, uh, uh, treatises on anything, really. They, they want it to be digestible or conversational. They want it to be in manageable chunks and, and organized, not just kind of here's a bibliography go, because nobody's going to do that. So my thoughts were, you know, n nobody these days reads anymore, so I'm going to read to them. <laughs> Right, and that yeah. was it, and that's and that's why I call them lectures in the in the kind of classic sense of uh, lecture uh, readings, because that's kind of how the series started. I would just kind of grab a book, and I would work through it, and I would kind of flip through some pages, and if there was something of import that jogged my memory, then I would say it. Over time, that evolved because uh, as time progressed we get more and more sources more and more evidence more and more specialists with conflicting opinions and so i had to start writing a script because i just i couldn't i couldn't just rap about this kind of stuff and do it any justice i had to do research beforehand and take a couple days to write my my stuff otherwise the quality would be bad so that was a big part of it it, it was kind of giving my two cents, which is, in my opinion, a, a sober perspective, but not one that is, I suppose, stifled in the imagination. And and so it's, it's something that I have the liberty of doing when I'm outside of academia, and so I'm having a lot of fun with it, but it's, it's also not the, the only mode of doing things. There's also writing books and, and um, hitting up the archives and, and doing all the translation work and that sort of thing. And that's kind of what's behind the scenes because you don't really put much of that stuff out on YouTube because you, nobody really cares. I certainly agree with you that the trend in at least 2017 and, and the last few years has been a blessing, of course, because you're more connected technologically than you ever had before, but then at, at the uh, opposite end of that is you also get all the distraction and all of the minutia and all of the advertising and all of the consciousness degrading things that usually tend to interfere with absorbing quality information such as your video series. So uh, I, I certainly will encourage listeners to check it out and we'll put a link to the series and to your channel as well. And this kind of touches on something, Dan, another aspect of your being the quote-unquote modern hermeticist, and that is an emphasis on, of course, as you say on your website, expanding the mind, kind of ingraining hermetic principles and living by those principles. And one of those things that you mention on online is the topic of fitness. And on just taking care of yourself, 
regarding overall health, fitness, researching, nutrition, all that stuff. Um, can you talk about if someone is a wants to be a hermeticist or wants to engage in hermeticism, what is the hermetic approach to fitness and to incorporating the physical aspect of this kind of overall consciousness expanding philosophy into your life? What are some of the fitness things that the modern hermeticist uh, is into? What I would do is I would divide this up into two kind of things. There is health on one hand and then there's fitness on another hand. And then those are kind of two separate but not necessarily distinct domains. On the fitness side of things, there's no one size fits all, obviously. I mean, everybody has their own sport or activity that they like to do. As, as long as it gets you panting and, and soaked in sweat and uh, sore the next day, then that's probably good enough. For me personally, I, I like Olympic style weightlifting and I like powerlifting and I like yoga. And those are really the, the three things, I guess two things that I, I really enjoy. Um, and that's because it is the pursuit of perfecting form. And it is also a way of distilling mind or will or basically just hard work into tissue, into literally your body. It's, it's, this really amazing kind of alchemical process of uh, transforming your your body and and becoming what you are, as the philosophers like to say, it's it's kind of carving out what is there at, at kind of the center of you and um, and and finding that and and then becoming it. And to me, there's something very spiritual about that, and and that's because I'm. A monist, essentially. I mean, I'm not strictly a monist, but by and large, monism is what I lean towards. Uh, I do not like to make this distinction between the mind and the body. I, I like to think of, you know, all reality is divine, but it is ultimately physical, and that these there are kind of worlds in between and dimensions and uh, that can be achieved, but ultimately this is all one thing, and these are all operating simultaneously on on various levels in regards to fitness or whatever if your if your body is fit if your if your body mind complex is in good health and it is fit, it is capable of doing acts it leads to a more rewarding happier life there's just no doubt about it and, and i mean i don't know what other people's goals in lives life are um Mine is to live a, a happy and healthy life, and that's about it. You know, I don't really have um, great aspirations to transcendence toward godhood or something like that, or ultimate beatific union with the divine or whatever, because to me, we're already there. Uh, I, I don't support this Gnostic Manichaean duality that I was raised with, this kind of uh, polarizing idea that there is a, a physical world that is somehow fallen and broken and that there is a, an ideal spiritual world that is beyond and that that world is superior and has to be tapped into uh, through asceticism. I don't personally subscribe to that. Uh, but since I look at things in a kind of monist context, all these things click together and and health fits into that part as well the the absence of pain is very important i mean how can you study or think about lofty things or 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 do anything have pleasure you know raising a family or or whatever it is you want to do if you're constantly in pain hmm. so great point that's something kind of that i've drawn from the epicurean or democratian schools of thinking which is the antithetical way of thinking in the western tradition it's the way that was hidden and that's something that i want to talk about a lot in my series is that there are kind of um these two competing schools of philosophy if we want to distill it into broad strokes like that, and that is between the realists and the idealists, and that uh, history is kind of born out of this dialectic between not the rich and the poor, not man and woman, but the idealist and the realist. And mm. so that's something that 
that interests me. So that's where training and, and physicality and all of this kind of stuff fits in. It's part of part of expanding consciousness, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I mean, you are literally, uh, when you do something like powerlifting or whatever, you are causing growth in your nervous system. You're causing like your nerves to become more intertwined with your body, and you can um, activate it in in kind of more fascinating ways than you could otherwise. And if you don't use your body, it atrophies. The nerves like waste away. Your connection to your muscles, to your body, essentially kind of fades. And there are a lot of people who they see themselves as heads on bodies, not bodies or Mm. body heads or this kind of complex of the two uh, unified into one thing. They, they are infected with dualism. They're infected by Platonism. And so they allow themselves to kind of waste away or wither away. And uh, they, they don't care about their body because they've adopted this dolaristic ascetic tradition um, rather than the tradition of, let's say, classical paganism, whether in Greek or Roman or Norse world or whatever, where uh, physicality was... Uh, it was it was important. It, it was something that was indistinguishable from life because it was life. I think for many people in the occult or esoteric community, a very common stage of realization that people go go through. I can't speak for everyone, but I can certainly say for myself, what you touched on certainly resonates because I remember growing up in a traditional Catholic environment and learning about original sin and this kind of good and evil dualistic concept. And then all of a sudden you start learning about Gnosticism and you find out, ah, the Yahweh in the Old Testament is actually a demiurge, a kind of mad, blind, William Blakeian, angry, cold, tear-filled creator god. And above that, above through the seven spheres, you'll find the plethora, the realm of Sophia and true wisdom and understanding. And for a while, just like you, I, I was kind of immersed in that dualistic vision, but then in a switch that you just touched on, which I think also echoes certain elements of Buddhism and Taoism, there's there's this other breakthrough which you touch on, which is forget about dualism. There is no lead that needs to be turned into gold. Everything already is gold. We just exactly. have, we just have to realize that we are gold and everything around us is gold would that be would that be fair would that be what you're yes. also touching on absolutely and i mean that's how i came to it as well and as cliche as it sounds you know lsd and buddhism is what brought me to that it was it was kind of getting out of my cultural milieu my my medium and going and looking at something completely different to kind of get a sense of what is the source of all this confusion? Why do we need ontology? Why do we need epistemology? Why do we need all of these kind of various disciplines, subdisciplines in philosophy? They don't have this kind of stuff in Eastern philosophy. And then I went and looked and I was like, oh, well, now I see why. And now you come back and it's not that you come back to Western philosophy and you go, oh, Western philosophy is so silly, so filled with, you know, naive assumptions and this and that. It's, <laughs> it's right. not. It's not that. It's just that you go, oh, I see there is that there is a current of thinking in in the Western tradition, which actually is quite analogous to, quote, unquote, Eastern philosophy. And that you can actually go and and find out that much of that stuff was not copied. It, It just didn't survive by and large because it didn't fit like Platonism or Aristotelianism fit with the dominant model, you know, in the Middle Ages when people were copying all of these these uh, uh, things. So mm. Democritianism, uh, you know, books like Lucretius' uh, De Rerum Natura, Epicurus's works, and, and um, you know, none of which survive. N- none of these people have anything that survives. It, it's all mostly the works of Diogenes Laertius, which are very late, almost a millennium 
after these people actually lived. Well, maybe not that long, but you come back from studying Eastern philosophy and you look at, at the West and you see, oh, these, these kind this way of thinking actually did exist in, to some degree in the West. It was just kind of, it was the losing party and it was written out of history. As a result of that, we inherit a lot of this intellectual baggage that comes down to us from uh, the, the winning party. We say that we've divorced ourselves from from religion or, or whatever, but even our secular humanism is largely based on religious principles. I mean, you think of, you know, the U.S. Constitution or something like that. Sure. It is the Constitution, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident, yes. you know, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with unalienable rights. And it's like, where does all that stuff come from? Well, that's, you know, none of that kind of stuff. You wouldn't find any of that in Eastern philosophy. This this is an outgrowth of a, a kind of platonic way of thinking. And that was the, the victorious way of, of thinking, thanks to Christianity's triumph over paganism. And that brings us to one of the most interesting topics. And I know you've touched on this as well, Dan, is... Uh, the relation between hermeticism and effectively what's labeled as ceremonial magic or magical practices and esoteric practices. Um, can you just touch on what are your thoughts all the way back from the Greco-Egyptian papyri through to the Byzantine Empire and then via Italy and the Latin Key of Solomon and then distributing into you know London and, and the English speaking part of Europe Th there's been this transmission of grimoires and grimoiric texts where they you know propose a way for and it was as you know very dangerous for people to even engage in this if you were caught as a priest for instance uh with any of these books you'd be executed summarily from from your perspective from the hermetic perspective can you just touch on the importance of or the role you saw or you see magic playing in terms of these grimoires that span over about a thousand years because it seems that there were historically there were people who were willing to take considerable risk to consecrate circles on the ground and even in a Terence McKenna like way one could argue uh, raise their consciousness via a ceremony to interact with multi-dimensional beings can you can you just what are your general thoughts I guess on magic in general all right well the way to kind of frame this historically is that my approach to this, where I come from this, at least from a formal perspective, is um, having done a translation of the Picatrix, which is under peer review at the moment. Uh, I'm, I'm a co-translator and editor of uh, this translation of this Arabic document, which contains, um, a, I mean, a massive compendium of, of spells. And what a lot of these spells are, are fundamentally pagan sacrifices to pagan gods. Um, so now these are transmitted and they are kind of framed within the context of astrology. So in the Picatrix, you get two major prayers which belong to the Sabaeans of Haran. And now uh, these were a group of uh, people living, in, well, there are actually multiple groups called the Sabians or the Sabians. Um, they're found in the Quran. They're one of the people of the book, so they're granted exemption. Um, so then a lot of people started calling themselves Sabians in order to acquire the exemption from the Quran so that they didn't have to pay zakat or uh, whatever it was. A lot of these kind of rituals, which were, say, the hymn to Saturn or the hymn to Jupiter, these were accompanied by uh, astrological hours, the right times, the right clothing, the right uh, instruments, the right objects, and these were all carefully delineated based on, you know, sympathetic resonances with this deity, uh, the respect, whichever respective deity was in question. And 
that went underground that that was transmitted to Europe through the Arabic world, generally into Spain. Spain was m mostly the place that was respective to um, these sorts of things, and they were translated from Arabic into Latin, and then and then they were they moved from there into the courts of Europe or into uh, what's called the clerical underbelly uh, of the uh, of the magical world, because grimoire magic requires literacy. And in, a, in an illiterate world or in a world where only the clergy or the laity are literate, who's going to be reading these grimoires? It's, it's usually going to be monks and priests. Right. So you have these people who are reading about a system of sacrifice, of conjuration, of prayer to pagan gods but but they are couched in kind of quasi scientific terms they're they're astrologized or whatever and this gets interpreted by say christians as ceremonial magic of summoning demons so it's like you're you're not communing with uh the spirit of saturn you're communing with a demon it can be no other way because it's this kind of dualistic Manichaean system where there is just God and then there are angels and then those are divided into good and evil angels, basically. I mean, there are powers and principalities and all this and that, but by and large, from a, from a, a very kind of simple rural Christian perspective or, or Muslim perspective as well, this is kind of blasphemous material because it, it's, it's summoning ancient gods to attend your sacrifices, which is one of the most blasphemous things that you can do in a Judeo-Christian religious setting. I mean, that's the, the abomination of desolation in the Old Testament or, or is, is a sacrifice to Zeus in the house of of God in the temple of Solomon. And there can be no like, kind of higher blasphemy. That's the, that's the apex. And so magic is often conceived of as someone else's religion. You touched on something certainly very important that when you look at the Greco Egyptian papyri, the magical papyri, uh, you know, that spanned anywhere from, you know, 300 years around the turn of the millennium, that the Egyptians were very neutral, so to speak, in their magical practice. They didn't view things as, you know, bipolarly as, as Christian Europe, where it was, you know, angels and demons, and it's either good or bad. They just kind of used whatever works. And I totally agree about Islam as well, where it is, of course, blasphemous. I think there might be a little more leeway, because at least with Islam, you have the element or the dimension of the the jinn. You have this kind of extra canonically accepted dimension of the jinn, where you know where the word genie comes from, and so these beings of fire exist and they're accepted. But as you so eloquently touched on, it's very very blasphemous. Just so interesting to see how the um, bipolar aspect towards magic changed once it hit Europe and the Middle Ages and all of that stuff for sure. Dan, I, I know our time's winding down, but I have to ask you about Terence McKenna, if we may. For the listeners who may not know, we'll we'll put a few links in this video in the description to Terence McKenna. But for those who don't know, his name's come up in our discussion a little bit, and both you and I are are certainly uh, uh, fans and have watched a lot of his videos, and I've I've read a few of his books. I, I assume you have as well. Yep, and I think it's safe to say that I've listened to and read everything he's ever done <laughs> now of course that isn't to say i agree with even like a quarter of it but but i've definitely listened to and could probably give a fairly good representation of his thoughts on a number of ideas <laughs> i i would absolutely have to agree um when you're on youtube and you see a literally a 10 hour lecture that's been compiled over like a weekend he did you might say, oh, you'd be crazy to listen to that. I have probably listened to that video uh, as, as, as you have, which is awesome, awesome to hear. And I, I know we could probably nerd out on Terrence McKenna. I, I was debating if we should turn Terrence McKenna into just a separate podcast if you have time in the future. But just for our listeners, briefly, 
can you talk about the influence of Terrence McKenna and its relation to her medicism? And for our listeners who don't know, Terrence McKenna effectively was one of the most influential American, uh, effectively, philosophers and psychonauts. He, he discussed philosophy, technological innovation, psychedelics, the impact on consciousness, time, the purpose of humanity, all that stuff. And there's thousands and thousands of hours, hundreds of hours, certainly, of his lectures online. But one of the things that he talked about was the importance of psychedelics and the expansion of consciousness. And I'm just wondering, can you talk a little bit about the philosophy of Terence McKenna regarding the expansion of consciousness via either psychedelics or he also touches like in shamanistic cultures you can you can hit you won't get the same thing as a dmt trip but you can change your consciousness with rhythmic dancing and drumming and deep meditation or even piercing yourself and lying in the hot sun and embracing pain there there's a myriad of ways to alter your consciousness and achieve some kind of higher state but in your day-to-day workings as the modern hermeticist what relation does terence mckenna's talks on consciousness expansion relate to, or what role does it play in hermeticism as you see it and practice it? So Terence McKenna's relationship with hermeticism was a very strange one because it was very colored by the literature that he had access to. And now I've heard, obviously, as probably most people have heard, uh, that he had two kind of huge libraries where he collected all number of rare old hermetic books. And, um, and both of those libraries have burned down, so we just have no idea what was inside of them. We, we can kind of reconstruct it based on the things that he's talked about, and I think there have been efforts to do that online. He really depended on the works of Carl Jung and the works of uh, Mircea Eliade. And my thoughts on them are complicated because their understanding of hermeticism and alchemy, which to them was kind of inseparable. And I think in the mind of Terence McKenna, it was also inseparable. And in my mind, they are very, they, they overlap, but they are quite separable. Hermeticism is more of a kind of philosophical kind of current. Anything to do with the corpus hermeticum is hermeticism, whereas alchemy is a, is a whole other thing because there is, you know, iatrochemistry and, and, and there is uh, uh, chrysopia and, and there's all these different branches of alchemical pursuits. And some of them have a little bit of flirtation with hermeticism and then others just don't at all. It's just kind of primitive chemistry. So what Jung wanted to do was look at alchemy as a mirror for the subconscious. And now that's dangerous because that's not what obviously the people who wrote these books were trying to do. And so to interpret those grimoires, which are really like sacred, you know, the code code word compilations of of decnomen, of uh, words that that mean chemical processes, these, these are occult notes. They're, they're not meant to uh, elucidate the scientific process. They're meant to hide the scientific process. And so in that way, they are uh, uh, hermetic in that they kind of lean towards occulting things. But I wouldn't say that there was so much of this, you know, true alchemy was the projection of the unconscious in the uh, alembic and that um, the real alchemy happened inside the body of the alchemist and and in his subconscious, and that the philosopher's stone was the psyche and all. This is all modern projection on medieval alchemists who, who don't have this kind of rhetoric. And I give a talk called The Historiography uh, on the re- Recent Literature of Alchemy, and I go into this in, in quite a lot of detail. So I think that Terence McKenna was heavily informed by that sort of school of thinking about alchemy. Uh, Also, Dame Frances Yates, uh, who created this sort of grand narrative of hermeticism that spanned over kind of a thousand years and went underground. And and that's there's just there's just not really much 
evidence for that. And so Terrence McKenna, as people have said before, uh, never let facts get in the way of a good story. And that's really where he shines, is getting people interested in alchemy, getting people interested in hermeticism and looking into this stuff, because it really is psychedelic. Let's be let's be fair. Like if you in the 90s, he was getting tired of talking about psychedelics all the time because he had been doing it for so long. So he wanted to shift gears and talk about something that was psychedelic, but not laden with dogma, like, say, uh, esoteric Tibetan Buddhism or Kabbalah or something like that, which he, he was familiar with these systems. But to him, alchemy was the untouched system. And really only Carl Jung had tapped into this. I think it's interesting. And uh, I like to read it. And I like to learn about what, you know, Carl, Carl Jung thinks about alchemy, uh, to know about Carl Jung's unconscious or to know about Ter Terence McKenna's unconscious. But what they had to say about the actual alchemists who lived throughout history is is another matter entirely. Well, we certainly will, uh, if you're interested, absolutely have to discuss all of the the good, the bad, and the just strange about Terence McKenna in depth in a future time. But I certainly appreciate your time, Dan. Fascinating stuff. I encourage the listeners to check out the uh, Encyclopedia Hermetica and your uh, channel as well. And uh, I, I guess as we wrap up here, Dan, is there anything else, any um, parting words of Sophia Ladin uh, wisdom or anything else that you might have uh, advice for those in the esoteric community or, or anything about Hermeticism that you wish people in the esoteric community might keep in mind uh, going forward? Yes. And that is something that I've been trying to kind of get around as a meme or whatever, is that just is the dirtiest word in the English language, or merely, or uh, only. So when you say, oh, that's just this, or that's merely that, you know, the whole is, is greater than the sum of its parts. And so let's try to be cautious a as to how we use the word just. We we all do it. I do it, too. And uh, it, it can really get our minds stuck down one avenue or another rather than exploring both of them. Well, that is certainly uh, words of wisdom for all in the esoteric community, whether they are looking at grimoire rituals or ceremonial magic or exploring the history of Hermeticism or uh, popping on a Terrence McKenna lecture. Uh, certainly... Boundary Dissolving Advice from Dan Natrell. Dan, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us on the podcast today. Well, thanks for having me, Alex. I really appreciate it. And thank you for listening to this episode of the Glitch Bottle Podcast and helping us uncork the uncommon this fine day or night or wherever you happen to occupy space time in your occult lairs, your summoning towers, or your cloistered libraries of the esoterically awesome. You can check out previous episodes and other magical Glitch Bottle news on YouTube, youtube.com slash Glitch Bottle, and you can download episodes on our blog, glitchbottle.blogspot.com. Please make sure also to subscribe and follow us on YouTube. And also you can follow us on Twitter at GlitchBottle, all one word. Our intro music is the track Tornado by David Zeste. Our magical interest is fueled by sincerity, passion, amazing guests, and a copious amount of clinking coffee cups. Until next time, this is Alexander F. reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. Keep the light.